Hey team, let's take a look at all of the Nobel Prizes in Physics that were awarded between 2011 and 2020. I'll give a brief description of the work that each prize was awarded for, and I'll leave some links in the description as well, because 10 years of Nobel Prizes really is too much to talk about in detail in one video. Remember that in most cases, the work was done many, many years before the prize was actually awarded, not in the year the prize was awarded itself. So this work is often being recognised long after it was done. Finally, I'll try and pronounce all of the names correctly, but I might not quite nail them all, so if I get any of them wrong, I'm very sorry. Let's get into this. The 2011 Nobel Prize in Physics went to three astronomers called Brian Schmidt, Saul Perlmutter, and Adam Rees for the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe through observations of distant supernovae. This prize was split due to different teams of researchers basically doing the same observations and calculations at the same time, and half went to Perlmutter and half went to Schmidt and Rees as a team. Each team basically measured the brightness of a special type of supernova, which is when a star reaches the end of its life and explodes, called a Type 1a supernova, which we refer to as a standard candle. This is because all Type 1a supernova explode at the exact same brightness. Since things look fainter the further away they are, measuring how bright these supernova actually looked in the sky tells us how far away they are, because we know how bright they should have been. All of the supernova they observed were fainter than they expected, which means they were actually further away than they expected. This in turn tells us that the universe is a lot bigger than we thought, by a lot as well, not just a little bit. So much so that the expansion of the universe must be accelerating to explain these observations. In the process of doing their research, these teams discovered the accelerated expansion of the universe nowadays, and that's what they won the Nobel Prize for for discovering dark energy. In 2012, the Physics Nobel Prize went to experimentalists Serge Arosh and David Wineland for groundbreaking experimental methods that enable measuring and manipulation of individual quantum systems. Sounds impressive, doesn't it? But how do you actually manipulate an individual quantum system? This basically means that they each found a way to control and contain individual quantum particles. Arosh's work did this with photons, the particle that carries light, and Wineland did it with charged particles called ions and it basically lets them observe quantum physics in action. They each isolated the particles and then found a way to control them. For the ions, this was done with electromagnetic fields, and for photons, this was done with two incredibly good mirrors very close together, and the photon just bounces between them for a very long time, allowing it to be studied. One of the coolest things that each of the teams observed was decoherence, the process by which quantum systems actually break down and become classical, losing their randomness and becoming predictable everyday objects. This is a good one. In 2013, the prize went to Francois Anglaire and Peter Higgs for the theoretical discovery of a mechanism that contributes to our understanding of the origin of mass of subatomic particles, and which was recently confirmed through the discovery of the predicted fundamental particle by the ATLAS and CMS experiments at CERN's Large Hadron Collider. This award was for theoretical work that both men did in the 1960s, which predicted a mechanism, now called the Higgs mechanism, to give particles in the standard model of particle physics mass, which we knew a lot of them had, but until then, we didn't know why or how. This work also predicted the existence of the particle called the Higgs boson. The discovery of this particle at CERN was also a mind-boggling achievement in science and engineering, and confirmed that the work that Higgs and Engler did was correct. The Higgs boson interacts with some of the particles in the standard model, and that interaction actually gives those particles their mass. The Higgs boson is the latest particle to become accepted as part of the standard model of particle physics. And moving forward, it's hard to see how the model will expand next, hence the impressiveness and difficulty of this work. The 2014 Nobel Prize went to Isamu Akasaki, Hiroshi Amanu, and Shuji Nakamura for the invention of efficient blue light-emitting diodes, which has enabled bright and energy-saving white light sources. LEDs is not something I know a lot about, so I'll keep this one brief. The three winners here were working in two teams. Nakamura and his team, and Akasaki and Amano and their team. And they both made essential progress towards the creation of the materials needed to make blue LEDs. In the quest to create LEDs that could be used as a source for white light, so they could be used for useful things like lighting buildings and homes, we required red LEDs, blue LEDs, and green LEDs. It turned out that the red and green diodes were relatively easy to create and had existed for some time. But finding and creating the right materials to get a diode to emit a photon with the right wavelength to be blue light was much harder, hence the Nobel Prize. The result, when combined with the red and green diodes, is a white LED, which now provides lighting that is much more energy and material efficient than traditional light bulbs, and they last longer too. The 2015 prize is another favourite of mine, and it went to Takaki Kajita and Arthur MacDonald for the discovery of neutrino oscillations, which shows that neutrinos have mass. Short and sweet. Kajita was in charge of the Super Kamio Kande Observatory in Japan, and MacDonald was in charge of the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory in Canada 
and the two collaborations showed, in around 1998, that neutrinos have mass. So neutrinos are part of the standard model of particle physics, and 2015's prize celebrates a really cool property that it turns out that they have. There are three types or flavours of neutrino in the standard model, and they're called the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. They're named after other particles in the standard model. Previously, when we had measured how many neutrinos we could detect from natural sources, like the sun, we found less electron neutrinos than we expected, but more of the other two types, which was pretty weird. This turns out to be because the three types of neutrino aren't really as separate as we thought, and as a neutrino streams through space, it can oscillate between the three different flavours. A muon neutrino could turn into an electron neutrino, an electron neutrino could turn into a tau neutrino, and so on. So lots of the electron neutrinos that we were expecting to detect were actually oscillating into the other types of neutrinos, muons and taus, before we could detect them. Physically though, this oscillating process can only occur if the neutrinos all have mass, even if that mass is absolutely tiny, which it is in the case of neutrinos. But the important thing here is the discovery that neutrinos actually have mass. That's why this discovery is so important, because we previously thought that neutrinos might have been massless, and this shows us that they definitely have a mass, and that's why they won the Nobel Prize. I find this next one a tough one to understand, so bear with me. But the 2016 prize went to David Thulers, Duncan Haldane, and Michael Kostelitz for theoretical discoveries of topological phase transitions and topological phases of matter. I won't waste your time with the bun and donut topology explanation because, to be honest, I really don't think it helps understand this work. But from what I do understand, the 2016 winners studied unusual states of matter, such as superconductors, superfluids, or thin magnetic films. They did this using some advanced mathematics from the field of topology, and they showed that these materials can have some amazing properties. And the task now is to go and find or create some of these new materials. Superconductors can be found in cooled layers of atoms, so thin they can be considered two-dimensional. And they're materials that electric current can flow through with no resistance from the particles in the material. Superfluids, on the other hand, are frictionless fluids where vortices can spin forever without slowing down. Future electronics could actually be built using some of the materials and properties that this work showed can exist. In particular, a topological insulator called stannine might replace copper components in computers, and would be very efficient. This means that although this work sounds quite theoretical, it might actually be one of the most practical winners on this list. If you have a really good way of understanding the 2016 Nobel Prize work, please let me know in the comments below, I'd love to understand it a bit better. In 2017, the prize went to three scientists studying gravitational waves, which had long been predicted by general relativity, but the technology to actually detect them was a very recent thing, thanks in large part to these winners. Rainer Weiss, Barry Barish and Kip Thorne, who won the prize for decisive contributions to the LIGO detector and the observation of gravitational waves. In 2015, the gravitational wave detector LIGO announced the very first detection of gravitational waves, ripples in the very fabric of space-time, in this case caused by the violent collision of two black holes spiralling into each other. Weiss did some theoretical work in the 1970s that predicted and analysed possible background noise that could mess up the detection of grav waves, and Thorne and Barish pioneered and led the detection efforts to ensure that LIGO successfully found grav waves, which they did. 2018 is the first year this decade that different recipients got different summaries of their work, but the overall prize was for groundbreaking inventions in the field of laser physics. Arthur Ashkin won half the prize for optical tweezers and their application to biological systems, while the other half went to Donna Strickland and Gerard Mohu, who in that order were actually PhD student and supervisor when they did this work, for their method of generating high-intensity, ultra-short optical pulses. First of all, Ashkin invented something called optical tweezers, which is a way of using light as a very precise tweezer to hold very small objects. Basically, if you shine a very strong laser that's brightest in the middle and gets weaker as it goes out, very small objects, as long as they can refract light, will generally stay in the centre of the laser. However, objects do tend to move along the length of the laser, and Ashkin developed a very clever way, using a lens, to stop this happening, so they truly stay very still in the laser. The tweezers are then very sensitive to small forces acting on the object in them, and Ashkin did some awesome experiments on molecules, including DNA, using these optical tweezers. The other half of the prize was for the development of a technique that could produce very short, very intense pulses of laser light. The idea here is to start with a short but pretty weak pulse of light, and to amplify it to become more intense, but in a very clever way. First, you take your weak pulse and you split it into its constituent wavelengths. 
Then you can amplify each wavelength individually, and this doesn't require too much energy. You can then recombine these individual wavelengths, and it gives you one super short, super intense pulse of light. This way, you don't break your amplifier by trying to amplify the whole thing at once, because this would just require too much energy and would probably just melt all your equipment. Nowadays, this technology is used to produce, for example, the laser light used in corrective eye surgery. 2019's prize was another split one, with the overall summary describing it as for contributions to our understanding of the evolution of the universe and Earth's place in the cosmos. This is a grand and impressive sounding statement, but also pretty vague. So let's see who won it. Half went to James Peebles for theoretical discoveries in physical cosmology, in what was essentially a lifetime achievement award. And the other half was shared by Michael Mayer and Didier Quelos for the discovery of an exoplanet orbiting a solar type star. Peebles is a cosmologist who's done an incredible amount in the field. So much so that it would be impossible for me to summarise his work in a reasonable amount of time. But his work included being part of a team that predicted the existence of the cosmic microwave background and associated a temperature with it, work on dark matter and how structure grew in the universe, and developing many of the key ingredients to the standard model of cosmology known as Lambda CDM. That's quite a lot already, so I'll just leave some links in the description for further reading on his work and move on to the other half of the 2019 prize. This went to Mayer and Quellos for discovering a planet orbiting a star that's pretty similar to our sun. This was done back when there was basically no known exoplanets and represented a remarkable discovery because it was the first time a planet was discovered in a different system that could look very similar to our own solar system. It's about 50 light years away and the planet is orbiting a star called 51 Pegasi and they discovered it using a technique called radial velocity. This is basically the idea that a planet doesn't really orbit a stationary star, but really the two objects orbit each other around their centre of mass. So while the planet was too small to see directly with a telescope, they could see the star oscillating back and forth, telling them there was a planet orbiting the star, giving it a tug and causing it to wobble back and forth. The speed and amount that the star wobbles back and forth tells them both the mass of the planet and how fast the star is orbiting it. Finally, the Physics Nobel Prize of 2020, and the third split prize in a row. Half went to the great Roger Penrose for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity. The other half of the prize was split between Reihardt Genzel and Andrea Ghez for the discovery of a supermassive compact object at the centre of our galaxy. It's an object that's 400 million times the mass of our sun in an area of space a bit smaller than our solar system, which means it's incredibly heavy and incredibly dense. It's definitely a black hole, but the Nobel Committee didn't call it a black hole because technically that hasn't been proven, but what else could it be? Basically, 2020 was the black hole Nobel Prize, probably spurred on by the photograph released by the Event Horizon Telescope the previous year. Gez and Genzel each led a group studying the centre of our galaxy in the 1990s, and they developed imaging and analysis techniques that let them see the compact object that lives there, which is called Sagittarius A star. The images they took showed stars orbiting an incredibly compact object, and the speeds that the stars were orbiting told them exactly how massive this object has to be. It basically has to be a black hole. While this is still indirect evidence for the existence of black holes, it's pretty much impossible to conclude that it's anything else. Penrose won his half of the prize for his theoretical work, showing that if general relativity is true, which it is, then black holes must exist, and they must contain a singularity a point of infinite density from which nothing can ever escape. If there is enough matter in a small enough region of space, it will form a black hole. Nothing too special is needed, and they really must exist. And we learnt this first, in part, due to Penrose. However, general relativity actually can't properly describe these singularities that it predicts, so there is still work to do, and maybe a future Nobel Prize for that. Talking of the future, what's next for the Nobel Prize in physics? Who knows, but I bet we won't have to wait long to find out. Please consider subscribing if you enjoyed this or found it fun. But until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye.